the Wapiti Formation. The Upper Cretaceous Wapiti Formation is a geological formation of the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, which spreads across northwestern Alberta and northeastern British Columbia. It is assigned to the Upper Cretaceous times approximately 80 to 68 million years ago. GM Dawson named it in 1881, ostensibly after the Wapiti River in Alberta. The formation lies on the marine shales of the Smoky Group. The lower part of the Wapiti Formation is formed of thick and pale sandstones deposited in inland fluvial and floodplain environments. The middle part contains mainly thinner layers of mudstones, whereas the upper part comprises of thicker lenticular sandstones and cores in overbank settings. Five units create the Wapiti Formation. The ones that correlate to dinosaur fossils are Units 3 and 4. Unit 3 was formed during a part of the Campanian stage, circa 74 to 73 million years ago. This terrestrial environment was disturbed by a congression of Cretaceous North America's Western Interior Seaway in southern Alberta. We covered the animals from that time in our aquatic episode called War Under the Ways and highly recommend watching it if you haven't done so already. Unit 3 includes the Pipestone Creek bone bed, source of the otherwise unknown dinosaurs Pachyrhinosaurus iacusti and Boreonychus seticorum. Hadrosaurid tracks are most abundant, also probably Tyrannosaurids or ornithomimids. The lower part of Unit 4 of the Wapiti Formation, which is dated approximately 72.5 million years ago from the Upper Campanian, was exposed along the southern bank of the Red Willow River. Sediments have been deposited on a fluvial flood plain. Tuodon's partial remains have been found in both units, the Hadrosaurid Edmontosaurus regalis is the most known dinosaur from Unit 4. It is also believed that Richard Doestesia like teeth have been found in many late Cretaceous geological formations, including the Wapiti Formation, Horseshoe Canyon Formation, the Scollard Formation, Hell's Creek Formation, Ferris Formation, and the Lance Formation, dated to about 66 million years ago. Many animals shared the paleo environment. The Tyrannosaurid Albertosaurus was probably the apex predator in its ecosystem. The mammals that lived in this region included Turgidodon ruselli, Simulestes, Didelphodon, Leptalestes, Kimlodon nitidus, and Parasimexomys proposcis. Vegetations of the region were represented by the aquatic angiosperm Trapago angulata, the amphibious Heterosporus fern Hydropteris pinnata, Rhizomus and Taxidaceous conifers. Pachyrhinosaurus The first specimens of Pachyrhinosaurus were discovered by Charles M. Sternberg in Alberta, Canada, in 1946. Pachyrhinosaurus's partial remains are known from different locations, such as the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, St. Mary's River Formation, or the Scabby Butte locality. One of these species' bone beds was discovered on the Wapiti River, south of Beaver Lodge, in northwestern Alberta. The species have been identified as Pachyrhinosaurus acousti, dated from about 73.5 to 72.5 million years ago. There are two more identified species. Younger Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis, known from the lower Horseshoe Canyon formation, about 71.5 to 71 million years ago, and the St. Peter River formation. 
and even younger species, Pachyrhinosaurus peratorum, which has been recovered from the Prince Creek Formation of Alaska, dated around 70 to 69 million years ago. Fossils found in bone beds included skulls and skeletons of different ages, from juveniles to full-grown individuals. It is an indication that the Pachyrhinosaurus cared for their young. First named in 1950 by C. M. Sternberg, their name meaning is in Greek, thick-nosed lizard, from Pachy meaning thick, rhino meaning nose, and saurus meaning lizard. While any other ceratopsid had a horn on the nose, Pachyrhinosaurus had distinctive features of the massive shelf of bone called a boss instead. There was also a small horn above the eyes and along the central line of the neck shield. A prominent pair of horns grew from the frill and extended upwards. The skull also bore several smaller horns or ornaments that varied between individuals and between species. In Pachyrhinosaurus iacusti, the two bosses were separated by a wide gap, whereas Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis and Pachyrhinosaurus peratorum, the frill bore two additional small curved backward pointed horns. The nasal boss in Pachyrhinosaurus was probably used in head sparring with members of the same species. They probably locked their horns together and pushed and twisted against their rival. This may have been used to establish their social and sexual dominance between males. Pachyrhinosaurus probably nested their eggs. It is uncertain if the young had been cared for by the parents. Pachyrhinosaurus was large and grew to 6 meters or 20 feet in length and it could get to up to 10 feet tall. Its weight is estimated at about 1,800 kilograms or almost 2 tons, although some individuals could be larger. Being a herbivore, Pachyrhinosaurus used their strong cheek batteries of teeth in its jaws to slice open and consume plants. They were able to chew through fibrous plants such as palms and cycads. Pachyrhinosaurus was likely to be preyed upon by the Tyrannosaurid Albertosaurus. Scientists believe that the species probably traveled in herds that helped keep it safe from predators. It is possible that these herds may have had hundreds or thousands of individuals in it at any one time, which could have made it quite difficult for their hunters. In general, average global temperatures were much warmer during the Cretaceous period in comparison to today. However, there were still dark winter nights in Alaska and northern Canada, and it is unknown if Pachyrhinosaurus migrated south during that time. Boreonychus Boreonychus partial remains were discovered in the 80s at the Pipestone Creek site near the city of Grand Prairie, central western Alberta. During a series of excavations, at least 27 individuals of the ceratopsid Pachyrhinosaurus iacusti were uncovered. The fossil consisted of a right frontal bone, 14 loose teeth that were like serrated steak knives, several postcranial bones, perhaps of the same individual, some bones of different dinosaurs, such as rare caudal vertebra, a claw of the second finger, and a sickle claw of the foot. It was established that Baryonychus was an extinct genus of Coleosaurian dromosaurid dinosaur. It lived during the late Campanian, approximately 73 million years ago, of the late Cretaceous Epoch in the area that is now known as Canada. The dinosaur was around 2 meters or 13 feet long and is believed to be as tall as a dog. The hands and feet were equipped with long claws and likely used for hunting similarly to its relative Velociraptor. 
According to the researchers, it is possible that Boreonychus had feathers to keep it warm in the cold, dark winters of northern Canada. Dr. Phil Bell and Dr. Philip John Curie named and described the type species Boreonychus ceticorum in 2015. The genus name is a variation of Boreonychus, standing for a northern claw. The specific name ceticorum was given to honor the Certec Heating Solutions Company from the oil industry that financially supported the excavations. Boreonychus was placed in the Velociraptorinae family. It is believed that its closest Mongolian ancestors crossed the land bridge from North Asia to North America. Its discovery is significant and helps to understand how the raptors moved and adapted to the environment. Edmontosaurus There are many Edmontosaurus specimens known, with some being very well preserved. It was established that this hadrosaurid habitat was in Canada, Alberta and Saskatchewan and the USA, including the state of Montana, South Dakota and Wyoming. The history of the naming of this species is very complicated and it's taken a long time. Before Edmontosaurus got its final name, it was assigned by Edward Drinker Cope in 1871 as belonging to a species of Trachodon, now a dubious genus of Hadrosaur, Trachodon atavus. However, Cope's rival, Othniel Charles Marsh, named another new species, Cleosaurus anectens, in 1892. The name Edmontosaurus was given in 1917 by the Canadian paleontologist Lawrence Lamb, who established the type species as Edmontosaurus regalis, and noted how the two specimens appeared to be similar to another species named Diclonius mirabilis. There are two recognized species of Edmontosaurus, the type species Edmontosaurus regalis, and the later one named as Edmontosaurus anectens. It is believed that both these species lived in the same area, but at different times. Edmontosaurus regalis was assigned to the Campanian era, whereas Edmontosaurus anectens, being a later Maastrichtian era species, and replacing regalis as the dominant Edmontosaurus species. Edmontosaurus belongs to the Saurolophines that had solid to no bony crests on their skulls. The crest was located above the eyes on the back of the head, which was only confirmed about 100 years after its discovery. The Edmontosaurini were among the last of the dinosaurs to evolve. It is assumed that they evolved from the solid crested types. It was the most abundant herbivore dinosaur from the late Cretaceous period. Many skeletons of this hadrosaur were found, and one of the skulls even had signs of theropod tooth marks, suggesting an attack to the neck. Another specimen has a missing part of the top of the tail due to injury caused by a predator's bite. Although it was healed, scientists managed to examine the wound and confirmed that it was bitten by a tyrannosaurid. All other hadrosaurids are compared to Edmontosaurus. Its tail was deep and heavy, and proved as good balance especially when it walked on hind legs. The hands had pads on their fingers which helped to weight bear while it stood on all fours. Edmontosaurus's skin was leathery, with small, non-overlapping scales. Edmontosaurus's skull was up to 118 centimeters, or 46 and a half inches long, and had a triangular shape. One of the specimens was assessed to have an additional covering of a keratinous beak that would have extended for at least eight centimeters in front of the mouth. The skull's shape and size changed with age. The adult forms would have had predominantly flatter and longer skulls than juveniles, 
Scientists made casts of the brain cavity and have been able to estimate it as proportionately small to its body size. This hadrosaur's brain was mainly orientated towards primal functions, such as sight and smell. The teeth were arranged in banks at the back of the mouth. It is thought that Edmontosaurus would have cropped plants with its beak, then ground food by the teeth at the back. Once these teeth became worn and lost, new teeth would start growing to replace them. The study shows that Edmontosauruses were probably grazers rather than selective browsers. Early studies suggest that Edmontosaurus would have run on the hind legs. However, more recent study confirmed that it would have been faster if moving on all fours in the form of a gallop. A frilly ridge of soft tissue ran down the central line of the neck and back. They were about 5 centimeters or 2 inches long and about 8 centimeters or 3 inches high. Initially, it was thought that Edmontosaurus regardless had been considered to have been the larger, reaching 9 to 12 meters or 29.5 to 39 feet at adulthood. However, the second species of Edmontosaurus, the Anactins, has been studied and confirmed as also growing to comparable size. Although Edmontosaurus is known to have had one of the broadest geographical distributions of all the known hadrosaurs, its migratory behavior is still not confirmed. Some researchers think that these species lived in groups. Living in herds would help to survive the attacks from predators such as Albertosaurus, Dasplitosaurus, and of course, Tyrannosaurus. Therefore, it was considered that Edmontosaurus may have had to continually move to find new places with vegetation. Some bone beds containing fossils of many individuals have been found, suggesting that Edmontosaurus drowned together as it tried to cross rivers swollen with floodwaters as happened with Ceratopsians. Another study suggested that hadrosaur remains recovered from more polar regions were from populations that lived there all the time, rather than from a migratory population. Perhaps one day, with more discoveries and research, it could be confirmed how these dinosaurs truly lived. Tuodon. Tuodon's remains have been found in many locations of Western North America, including Alberta in Canada and Montana in Wyoming or New Mexico in the USA. Fossils of this dinosaur from the Wapiti Formation include its teeth. It is thought that it lived in the Campanian stage of the late Cretaceous about 70 million years ago. The name was given by the American naturalist Joseph Lydie in 1856. Trudon Formosus is described as a coleosaurian dinosaur and belongs to the same clade as modern birds. The name in Greek means wound tooth because some of its teeth were razor sharp. After examination, it was concluded that Truodon was a small, bird-like dinosaur that lived during the Cretaceous period, about 76 million years ago. It is estimated that this dinosaur was about 2 meters, or 6.5 feet long, and weighed nearly 50 kilograms, or 110 pounds. The tail was long and had stiffened, flattened chevron bones. The arms were long and slim, with three-fingered hands and sharply curved claws. It had very long legs similar to Velociraptor, a switchblade-like second toe claw that it held clear of the ground as it walked or ran. Remains of nesting parents and egg clutches have been discovered, shedding some light on the resemblance of reproduction strategies with both crocodilians and birds. It is believed that Truodon produced a pair of eggs every day 
for a period of a minimum of a week. A clutch could therefore be about 16 to 24 eggs. The parents would bury them partially in mud, and then the parent would come back and sit on the eggs to keep them warm. Trudon's brain was very large, about a golf ball in size, proportionally larger than those found in living reptiles. Some scientists consider Trudon to be more intelligent than the average dinosaur, and perhaps as much as modern birds. The advantage of having a big brain was probably good eyesight, hearing, and a strong sense of smell. And this probably helped this dinosaur outwit its prey. And some experts think it might have sometimes hunted in packs to take down larger prey. Now that's smart. Trudon was an active, agile hunter that had large, forward-facing eyes that granted it keen vision for hunting, even at night. It would follow its nose to catch small lizards, mammals, invertebrates, and perhaps even young duck-billed dinosaurs, like Amurosaurus. The animal's rotatable forearms, which sported three-fingered hands, likely aided Tuodon's hunting prowess. It could have used its long arms and finger-like claws to snitch the prey. Its 120 small, sharp, cutting teeth of several different shapes most likely allowed this dinosaur to eat not just meat, but also seeds, nuts, and fruits, making it an omnivorous animal. Tordon's eyes were set towards the front rather than the side of its face, indicating that this dinosaur possessed advanced binocular vision. So, this dinosaur could have directly seen what was ahead. Each of these eyes would have seen a separate image, which would then have been combined into the one image. It enabled Trudon to see in 3D mode, with better perception of relative distances and depth. Eagles, humans, and snakes also have binocular vision. Many herbivorous animals have eyes located on the sides of their heads. It gives prey a larger field of vision, so they can see more around them and notice the presence of approaching predators. Sauronithalostes Sauronithalostes was discovered in 1974 by Canadian amateur paleontologist Irene Vanderhoel. She discovered the skeleton of a small theropod near Steveville in Alberta. It was later shown to John Storer of the Provincial Museum of Alberta, who brought it to the attention of Hans Dieter Seuss of the National Museum of Natural History of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Seuss described the specimen in 1978 and named the type species Sauronithalostes langstoni. To Seuss, the species resembled the Sauronithoridae, which is seen presently as part of the Truodontidae. The second part of the name comes from a Greek word, lestes, meaning thief. The specific name honors Juan Lanston Jr., another American paleontologist. Sauronithalostes remains have been found on both sides of the Western Interior Seaway. Apart from Canada, Alberta, Sauronithalostes remains were found in the United States, in Montana, New Mexico, Alabama, North Carolina, and South Carolina. The second species have been described as Sauronithalostes sullivani in 2015. Sauronithalostes langstoni was a small bipedal dromosaur reaching about 1.3 to 1.8 meters or between 4 feet 3 inches and 5 feet 11 inches in length with a weight between 5 and 22.5 kilograms or 11 and 50 pounds. It was 60 centimeters or 2 feet tall at the hips. This small, bipedal, lightweight, meat-eating dinosaur had long legs 
with a sickle claw on the second toe. Similarly to Velociraptor, it had large fang-like teeth in the front of the jaws. These videos take a very long time to create. If you would like to support the channel and assist in improving it, then do please subscribe and give us a like, and consider joining our Patreon. Links in the description.